This is the shoreline of Cape Canaveral, Florida, as it might have appeared to Spanish explorers centuries ago. Following those early explorers, well into the 20th century, a new breed of daring young men came to this land, probing the heavens with rockets and spacecraft, changing the face of the land into what is Cape Canaveral today. Soon after World War II, America established the long-range probing ground at Cape Canaveral, a narrow strip of marshland facing 5,000 miles of uninterrupted Atlantic Ocean. On July 24, 1950, a new era in rocketry began for America. A captured German V-2 modified with a WAC Corporal second stage was launched from the Cape. It was the first of thousands of rocket launches, which would follow over more than four decades of weapon system tests and space exploration. Early test programs with unusual names crowded the Cape launch schedule. Matador, an Air Force winged missile, jet powered and launched from a mobile platform. It flew at subsonic speed and had limited range. Snark, the first winged missile designed with intercontinental range. And Navajo, a 5,000-mile range, rocket-boosted, jet-powered weapon system which was plagued with many failures. These early programs were important test beds for engines and guidance systems which were eventually developed for use in today's ballistic and cruise missiles. This was Redstone, a U.S. Army short-range ballistic missile which would eventually boost America's first satellite and first astronaut into space. As testing increased, construction of new facilities became necessary. A center for control of range safety, instrumentation, and schedule. Larger launch pads and advanced electronics to track and record flight data for later analysis. Some of the early tests were spectacular failures. But they provided valuable answers to many technical questions about propulsion and guidance. This was Thor, an intermediate range ballistic missile of the 1950s. It performed so successfully that an updated version is still being used to boost satellites into orbit. Soon the Cape landscape was marked with launch pads and service towers to test the ICBM weapon systems of the late 1950s and early 60s. There was a missile gap to be closed in those years, and these were the rockets chosen to accomplish it. Atlas. Titan, and Minuteman, the last ICBM system developed by the United States to deter aggression from any potential enemy. During the 1960s and 70s, activities at the Cape shifted toward the peaceful exploration and utilization of space. A variety of spacecraft and satellites were launched into Earth orbit, as well as on interplanetary journeys aboard modified rockets originally developed for weapon systems. This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go. 1.2G. Kevin at 14.
Man soon followed the satellites and spacecraft into the heavens. The launch systems which served the military defense needs of America took on a new role, okay, dispatching on, astronauts into space. In the mid-60s, the Air Force introduced the Titan III space launch system to the Cape. The Titan workhorse placed tons of payloads into orbit, providing vital defense communications, nuclear test detection, and data for scientific research projects. From July 1969 to December of 1972, gigantic Saturn V lunar rockets carried men to six successful landings on the moon. The 1980s ushered in the era of today's space shuttle, the world's first reusable spacecraft. It is launched like a rocket, orbits the Earth like a satellite, and then returns to Earth like an aircraft. A wide variety of payloads for each mission is routinely placed into orbit for both domestic and foreign users, as well as for the American military. Throughout the past decades, the mission support given by Cape Canaveral Air Force Station has played a vital role in the success of America's space and missile program. Today, the Cape and several downrange tracking stations provide a test range of more than 10,000 miles, stretching across Antigua and Ascension Island to the Indian Ocean. The prime mission of the range is to support operations for the Department of Defense and civilian space programs. A large part of the support is to gather data from a variety of systems. This data, collected and processed by computer, is delivered to the range user, who can then evaluate the performance of each rocket flight. There are radar units, which show velocity and position of the vehicle during the powered phase of flight. Telemetry, to send back to controllers on Earth the status of functions and conditions taking place aboard the rocket and spacecraft during the mission. And photography in many forms, to document the launch for engineering analysis, or to provide public information releases, as well as motion pictures and video records for the Air Force and other agencies. Among the highest performance tracking telescopes is the Distant Object Attitude Measuring System, or DOMES. It's permanently mounted in an elevated sphere and is a blend of modern electronics and optics. It has dual 24-inch diameter telescopes and direct-drive torque motors, which provide exceptionally smooth tracking. Directed by radar, computer, or manual tracking, it provides two video outputs, one 35-millimeter motion picture film record, and target position data for range safety purposes. Perhaps the most vivid demonstration of the value of photography in solving problems was in the Challenger disaster. A remotely operated camera close to the launch pad clearly showed an exhaust leak in one of the two solid rocket boosters, a leak which ultimately caused the fatal explosion. The range control center on the Cape is the nerve center for operations on the range. During a mission, all support functions are coordinated and controlled by the superintendent of range operations. At the command destruct console, the flight path of a rocket is carefully monitored. If it deviates from the intended trajectory, 
a signal is sent which destroys the vehicle to protect lives and property. We had to be sending functions there. We gave it enough time. We've confirmed it with the IPs. Right. Lost it versus time. We're sending functions. Senior concurs. The arm and destruct. Team is in noise. Roger, TM. An up-to-date weather station in the control center provides schedulers and the launch team with accurate forecasts of conditions which could affect a mission. Throughout the Cape, there are many facilities to receive, check out, and assemble the various components of rockets and spacecraft scheduled for launch. Expansion of facilities is an ongoing process. Modification of some and completely new construction of others. Much of the expansion is being done to accommodate commercial use of space with expendable launch vehicle programs. Pad 40 has been dismantled and is being rebuilt to accept the new Titan IV vehicle. Construction is also underway for an upgraded solid motor assembly building in the Titan launch area. The Titan IV is the Air Force's newest and most powerful expendable launch vehicle, scheduled for many future military and civilian space missions. A new launch operations control center consolidates test control and management of the Titan IV launch vehicle. The facility supports spacecraft, launch management, and communications operations. Pad 36A has been modified to accept the new Atlas II vehicles, as well as the older Atlases. The modifications were made to accommodate the larger booster and allow for future use. Funds for the refurbishment were provided solely by General Dynamics' commercial expendable launch vehicle program. Extensive changes were also made to pad 36B. This was the first launch pad to be used for both Air Force and commercial launches. As CAPE activities progress into the 90s, developmental testing will continue to decline as full-fledged operational space programs increase. A new range operations control center has been built to consolidate and integrate all range control functions. More than $40 million worth of range surveillance equipment will be installed to complete the facility. When operational, the range operations control center will be an important step in the modernization of America's space launch facilities. Rocket fuel and oxidizer are housed in the Cape's fuel storage area. Recent modifications to this facility now make it the safest storage area ever built, meeting or exceeding all national codes. At the south end of the Cape is Port Canaveral. Range instrumentation ships make Canaveral their home port between launch assignments, as well as cruise liners and other commercial vessels. The U.S. Navy, with range support, also operates a program of sub-launches from the port during their demonstration and shakedown operations. During a shuttle launch, two specially equipped vessels leave the Cape to recover the expended solid rocket boosters which impact into the Atlantic Ocean. The ships tow the boosters back to the Cape for refurbishment and reuse. Like any town or city, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station has a police and security force to regulate traffic and protect the premises from any unauthorized entry. Beyond those basic duties, the security force also establishes roadblocks during hazardous operations. 
They control protesters who oppose certain weapon system testing. And they guard secure areas. Despite decades of preparing and launching rockets, wildlife still abounds within the 15,000 acres of Cape Canaveral. The protected animal life reflects government concern in maintaining a viable ecology alongside space age activities. Among the endangered or threatened species at the Cape are the homely manatee or sea cow and the American alligator. The Atlantic Ocean beaches serve as nesting sites for the giant loggerhead and green sea turtles. Historically, very few eggs survived the plundering of marauding raccoons who systematically raid their nests. But recent management efforts have dramatically increased the survivorship of the nests. The hatchlings instinctively head for the ocean, driven by a genetic impulse to seek the safety of the surf. In 15 or 20 years, some of them will return to the Cape shoreline to lay eggs and start the life cycle all over again. The earliest known inhabitants of the Cape were Aboriginal Indians. Evidence of their civilization remains in the form of burial mounds and shell middens nestled in foliage near rocket launch pads. The graveyards of early settlers are preserved at their original sites. One grave site is located in the median strip of the Cape's main access road. One of the first lighthouses to be built on the southern U.S. coast was at Cape Canaveral. The original lighthouse was built of brick in 1847, but because of beach erosion, was moved one and a half miles inland and reconstructed with wood and steel plates in 1894. The first permanent lighthouse keeper was Captain M.O. Burnham, who with his family served it well for over 30 years, from 1853 to 1886. At the launch sites for America's first satellite and first astronaut, the Air Force has established an unusual museum, one which has permanently preserved, with actual space hardware, a history of rocketry leading to man's venture into space. It's a unique display of missiles and rockets, some of them rare and forgotten. Nearly a quarter of a million people visit the museum annually to see the free world's largest display of space hardware. They come from all walks of life and from all over the world to marvel at the rare collection of space vehicles. At the museum's exhibit hall, there are colorful and informative displays. scale models of rockets old and new. Even an actual Gemini spacecraft, the only one flown into space twice, can be closely examined. The displays and exhibits are a veritable preservation of the rich history and exciting development of rockets and missiles of the past. The Air Force Museum at Cape Canaveral has been designated as part of the nation's historical properties belonging to the National Historic Register. The use of expendable launch vehicles to place commercial payloads into space has considerably increased launch activity at the Cape. Scheduled launches of military satellites and commercial payloads with Titan, Delta, and Atlas vehicles has assured the Cape a viable place in the future of America's ventures into space.
The missions and programs of the past have laid the foundation for man's reach to exceed his grasp. They've transformed dreams of yesteryear into realities today. And at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida, the routine thunder and fire of rockets ascending into the heavens has opened a veritable gateway 